My name is Hüdayi Yavalar. I'm originally from Turkey. I'm Arctic. Uh, what you said about Turkey, I disagree with you about the uh, secularism reaction in Turkey and for Europe. Because we have Alevis also, 20% of the Turkish Alevis, they pay their taxes. But the Sunnis, they spend all the money and they don't have the enough money to build their own Alevis, their own places. There's a hundred thousands mosques in Turkey. Now, my question is going to be something else. In the Quran, chapters, Maide calls five, do not make friends from the Jew and Christians. Verses 51, how would you explain that? And also, chapter... I think that I think that, that gives a good question, and again, we want to be stopping on time, so you've got a good question there with that verse, and then the other people behind you will also have uh, a chance. The other one is the chapter 9, Tobe, <laughs> verses 5 says, kill all no, the... No, no. Kill all the infidels. You, ha you have you a question. To move on. He's going to answer your question, right. but that's it. Uh, once again, this is something which is... Uh, the problem that we may have with people taking a verse and say, it's written like this, don't make friends, and that means that the Muslims uh, will just read this and that's it. There are many other verses which are just saying exactly the opposite. This has to be contextualized in a situation of war where the point was, and this was understood by Mufassirin, which are people commenting the Quran in a very specific uh, situation of alliance. Don't use or make friends with people who can betray you in a very specific situation. But be careful. This is exactly what we mean by interpreting and contextualizing. Don't take one verse out of any context and say, this is it. We have what the Muslims think, because the Muslims are not thinking like this. And the mainstream Islamic discourse on all these verses that you are mentioning and others is saying, we should not have a problem being friends with Muslims and non-Muslims, Christians, Jews, and today, atheists, Hindu, and Buddhists. And in the Buddhist tradition, look at what the Indian Muslims were saying in a very, very specific context of dealing with Hindus and Buddhists. We don't have a problem to deal with them. While in the other side, we had Muslims living in, uh, in, uh, in Muslim uh, Arab countries saying, no, the Buddhists are not uh, worshipping one god, but we had two different answers because the people were dealing with two different contexts and relying on the same texts. So I think that you have to be careful. Don't quote a verse to get the essence of what the Muslims think. But this is the word of the God. Uh, I'm, I'm Thank sorry. You. Uh, Kill all the uh, can we have the next question, please? Excuse me. I'm sorry, uh, but we Thank do you. need to have everyone you have the chance to ask a question. Hi, Dr. Ramadan. My name is Kent Davis Packard, and I'm, I just received my doctorate from the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. Um, could you please speak a little about the Constitution of Medina, a document you use in one of your books as an example of an authentic Islamic text written by Muhammad himself that holds some of the overarching principles of modern democracy? When you Google the Constitution, you find hundreds of websites in Arabic using the document to make this link between original Islamic governance and democracy. How significant do you think this document is now for the general Muslim layperson? And do you think it has the capacity to become, for Islamic legal scholars, a legitimate source of evidence in the future that Islam at its core contains some modern democratic principles? That's a, a, a good question and deep question. It should, we should have a lecture on that. <laughs> but very quickly, if you come back to what I said in the book Islam in the West and the Challenges of Modernity about this, what I'm referring to is not about only the Constitution and saying this is a, a, a text reference. What I'm saying, which is quite important in the discussion about, you know, in, it, it is in the chapter comparing Shura and democracy. Because we had, even in my you know, the own background that was mine, so people say, we don't speak about democracy, we speak about Shura. I say, I don't care about this. I don't care about the words, let us come to the principles. So what I'm extracting from what is called a constitution, I'm quite cautious not to speak about constitution, it's the legal framework, is to say what we can extract from this are the principles. The principles, and then for me today, is to be able to say five main principles I don't have a problem with. And I speak with the language of today, rule of law that we can extract from this. Equal citizenship, because you have in this text 
speaking about the Jews, for example, lahum malana wa alayhim ma'alayna, they have the same, speaking about the Jews, they have the same rights and the same duties as us, which is quite interesting in the principles, how do we, we are going to implement that today, I don't know, but the principle is not disputable. Muslims and non-Muslims, the same rights. So this is one thing, which is universal suffrage, accountability, and separation of power. So I would say that what I'm taking is not to duplicate the model, is to understand the principles behind the models. And this is something which is quite important. I have a problem with some interpreters or Muslims are trans. For example, today, Hizb al-Tahrir, for example, the party of liber the liberation, liberation Party, they completely disagree with me because they read this text by saying this is the framework of the model. No, the model is historical. I'm concerned about extracting the principles that could be universal. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ramadan, for coming here today. Um, my name is Fahim Chisti from the University of Maryland. Um, my question is with regards to, again, your concept of text, the scholars of the text and scholars of the context. Uh, as you know, the Quran was revealed in some historical context as well. So the tradition of Islam is built upon a certain historical context, which is enshrined within the two sciences related to Quranic sciences, which are Asbab al-Nuzul and also Nasikh al mansukh and through that, we have created a tradition of the ijma. There is like a continuance of it as enshrined in the ijma. My question to you is, uh, how does radical reform, uh, or your radical reform, your notion of radical reform, deal with notions of the ijma, asbab nuzul and nas al mansukh Now, I'm going to methodologically intervene again as a mean man. I, uh, Take I would whole like question. to last <laughs> all right. three of these questions so that you can answer those three as your sort of grand summation. Uh, my name is Rama Kudemi. I'm a first year student in the conflict resolution program here. And um, like you said, Professor Ramadan, there's a dual problem with um, scholars who think they have authority to rule about on any issue, but also Muslims who kind of accept their um, authority without questioning it. How do we, how do, does the Muslim community um, worldwide get beyond that mindset that Scholars are, you know, at a level that we cannot challenge, and it's not only just scholars, but scholars that are trained in certain, um, you know, countries that are acceptable, and everyone else is kind of has to just accept their authority. Thank you. Okay. And finally, uh, my name is Abd Rahman Shamsuddin. I'm a PhD student in Islamic studies here at Georgetown University. Being the last one, I lost my questions because they, <laughs> they asked <them. laughs> but kind of. Uh, I want to make sure that I have the feeling that uh, you consider the current uh, context as universal context. Uh, and the second question is, uh, being radical and reforming the mindset of Muslims, how does this position work with the concept of jama'ah in Islam? Or in, uh, in other words, how does your position differ than any other radical movement in, uh, in Islamic thought? Like what? Like uh, any other well, radical. Tell me about the <laughs> radical movement. Sorry? Tell me about the radical movement. Any radical movement, even militant movements, I mean. Okay. Because they also think that they have to reform the mindset of Muslims. Okay. <laughs> okay, so about, uh, uh, for the first uh, question. Uh, I would challenge what you said, that at the beginning we only had two sciences with Azbab and Nuzul and, and, uh, and Nasir and Mansur and uh, uh, abrogation was something which was central in, in Ijma. No, it's deeper than that. I think that from the beginning, the Muslim scholars, when they have to deal with the Quran, is what, it was really about, you know, it, you know the, the difference between orthodoxy and orthopraxy, which is something which is the legal tradition is the first Islamic science, the, the legislation. So it's really something which is we deal with the text, we deal with the spiritual dimension, but we are dealing with law. And uh, it's not only about uh, Asbab and Nuzul. It's something which is deeper than, than it's really to take into account the context as something which is quite important. So this is why, for example, the first scholar who, who started to categorize Ibn uh, Malik, for example, is speaking about something which is quite important is uh, 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 in the, 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 the the, uh, the, the, the reality of the silence of the text is al masalih al mursala which is what is left to the Muslim mind to think about because the text is silent. So it's deeper than only these three dimensions. Now, now I would say that uh, uh, our, our coming back to the text 
in all these fields when it comes to Asbab and Nuzul is critical. Of course, we need the, the cause of